A decade ago, pop was an unstoppable force in the charts. As boy bands and girl bands showed a generation how to sing, dance, do denim and slam dunk the funk. But for many idols, the dream came to an abrupt end. We were dropped. We were a product. Now, six former pop heavyweights are reuniting, dusting down their outfits and polishing their dance moves as they prepare for an epic one-off gig. This is literally starting over from scratch. I am going to fight the corner. I'm not a pushover anymore. This is The Big Reunion. Previously on The Big Reunion, five revealed the stories behind the image. It was Beatles pandemonium. It was like strapping yourself to a rocket, going boom. There'd be fights going off. Like, Shut up! We were delinquents. And they were dealt a bitter blow when Jay told the band that they'd have to keep on moving without him. I was annoyed with Jay when he said he didn't want to be part of this. Liberty X exposed the secrets behind the cat suits. I was addicted to slimming pills. Am I going to get found out that I've been taking these pills? Am I going to get written about because I've put on more weight? This is just a whole new level of shite. There was no massive big breakup. There was no children crying through helplines. And for one member of Liberty X, getting back on stage will be a huge challenge. I'm going to have a double mastectomy and reconstruction. Tonight, three feisty kittens and pop poster boys 911 dish the dirt. There she goes, looking like a star. 1998, Liverpool. A buxom blonde Kerry Katona was hungry for a taste of stardom. I always, always knew from a really, really, really young age I was going to be on the teller. I remember being a kid and having my leotard on and he used to turn the TV off so I could see myself dance. Not one to hide her light under a bushel, Kerry was hell-bent on getting herself noticed. Even before I was famous, I was always really well known. I don't, don't know why I think it might be my gob. Aged 17, she was already working as a glamour model, lap dancer and performer in a musical dance troupe the subtly named Horn Kings. I'm in Germany performing and this guy approached me and he said, a friend of mine is putting a girl band together, why don't you go and... See them? I thought I've got no lose. Kerry's talent for showing a lot of front instantly impressed, and Atomic Kitten was born. It wasn't long before she was joined by Scouse schoolgirl Liz. Liz is kind of like the cute, tomboyish one. I was shy, always spoke really quietly. You know, I was like the feisty, gobby one. Kerry was a nut effort from that first second. A third kitten was needed to make the kittens whole, so they stuck an ad in the local paper. One of the first people to reply was this crazy, deep-voiced redhead. Literally from day dot, there was drama. I didn't like her. I was told I'll go around to the flat with the girls and do some dancing. And I'm doing all these dance routines. And I was just like, oh, well, what about if we do it like this? This was my band. Who the hell does this 16-year-old girl think she is coming in under my roof, criticising my dance routines? Well, I'm sorry, I'm just not working with her. <laughs> I think I'd kind of pushed the nose out of joint a little bit. So, a spiky start for the pop princesses. Flashback to five years earlier, and two northern lads are taking their first steps towards fame. Myself and Spike used to be on a TV show called The Hitman and Air. It was basically a kind of nightclub with Michaela Strachan and Pete Waterman with the presenters. Another scintillating night, another scintillating game. Unbelievable. All the big artists like E17, whoever was on the bill, we used to dance in between them all. And obviously the generation before me and Spike was uh, Jason Orange from Take That. And when we seen them and how many girls were going for him, we were like, oh, we want a piece of this. 
Jimmy and Spike were solid dancers, but to complete the pop band, they had to confront the old-fashioned notion of drafting in someone who could actually sing. As soon as we get somebody in, as soon as we can get on the road and get some women, you know, that, that's all we were kind of in it for. And their luck was in. Would-be singer Lee Brennan was a fan of the dancing duo and badgered their management for an introduction. I'd seen them a couple of times, like, in my hometown of Carlisle, switching on Christmas lights, and I always thought they were amazing dancers. We met him in, in Burger King in Carlisle. <laughs> and for me, I was meeting two famous guys. Yeah, that's really cool, like. He said himself that he was quite starstruck with the whole situation. The first thing I noticed was they had the jeans tucked into the boots, and I thought, twats. Now the trio was complete, and a new boy band was unleashed. This is now the beginning of 911. Let's see how far we can take this. We're going to have a number one one day. That is our aim. We're going to work our asses off. Um, and we're going to do Wembley Arena. Undeterred by a lack of interest from major record labels, they took their rough and ready show on the road and built a fan base from scratch. So, yeah, we spent probably a good year and a half, I think, just doing school tours. We were doing about five to six, seven shows a day. There was the excitement and there was the, the buzz because it was just three guys breakdancing and flipping all over the stage. After 18 months of relentless backflipping in school halls across the country, the boys struck gold with a record deal worth three and a half million pounds. There was always girls outside and we couldn't leave our hotels. You just couldn't go anywhere. With a deal in the bag, girls flinging themselves at their feet, 911's journey to superstardom had begun. Coming up, the tales of excess and bad behaviour that broke the bands. I was just like a walking hormone. Oh, my God, talk about binge drinking. I just completely broke down. I thought, I don't want this anymore. Looking back to how it was then, you was basically in prison. We were literally screaming at each other. <laughs> he slammed me into this glass door. I just lost it. Newly formed and fresh-faced Atomic Kitten and 911 were getting a taste of pop stardom and they were loving it. In 1996, 911 released three singles, all of which inched their way into the nether regions of the charts. But it wasn't until they shook their bodies that they hit the big time. So a massive turning point for us was Body Shaking. It was a song that catapulted us to bigger than we could ever imagine. Everywhere we turned up, there's just banners everywhere. You got my body shaking all the time. Body Shaking stormed into the UK charts at number three and kick-started the band's global takeover. We got to Malaysia and no-one had told us, like, we'd taken off there. And we just thought we'd be unknown. It was just crazy. We got out of the airport, there was just thousands. In the end, the, the, the record company brought the army in because it was just ridiculous. We were getting ripped apart, they were pulling our hair, our clothes. They came in, parted everybody, and we just like, ran on this bus and obviously gave us a, an army escort, police sirens were going everywhere, and we were just thinking, this is ridiculous, there's got to be a wind-up. We said to me, what's going on here? And they were like, oh, you're number one. Like album and single charts, and it just went huge there. I think we finished up 12 times platinum. <laughs> And in 1999, the lads hit the ballad button and cracked their first UK number one with a little bit more. Uh, lots of people getting crushed. Okay, no. All for us, wonder why. Can't be our music. 
911 had sold a ridiculous 10 million records and were heartthrobs worldwide. But like any boy band, there was one important rule. Obviously, our manager always said, this is your image, you are seen as a, a clean-cut boy band. And he did tell us no girlfriends and all that stuff at the start, which obviously we completely ignored. I was just like a walking hormone. We are just up all night with women and drink. Jimmy was naughty. Spike was the naughtiest. He was just an animal, he was just a dirty bastard. There's been many occasions that we've kind of woke up and thinking, I don't know what went on last night. All I know is there's two women in my bed. I don't know who they are, what their names are, but I've just called a taxi for them. While touring the Middle East, Britain's cultural ambassadors flew into strict Muslim country Bahrain and behaved as if they were on holiday in Magaluf. Got smashed at the bar and everybody just jumped in the pool. Everyone naked and everything and uh, police turned up and was going to arrest us. They were saying you can get 10 years for this. It was illegal, you know, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't do that kind of thing. And they ended up just taking us, like guards, to the stage, putting us on stage, getting us off, driving us straight on the tarmac of the airport and just deporting us. While 911 were riding high, Atomic Kitten were playing catch up but had a breakthrough with the lofty accolade of supporting 911 on their 1999 tour. We like to prank him. I think we got a load of foam one time. We just put loads of foam in their shoes and they wasn't happy. I think on the last night at all, they trashed our changing room and put like now I want to shit pictures everywhere <laughs> and I went behind stage and pissed in the trainers <laughs> Atomic Kitten were becoming big news and ITV's this morning picked the up-and-coming pop act for a week-long feature Yay! I'm Tommy Kitten! I'm Natasha! I'm Kerry! I'm Lil! With our first single right now we released in Japan before we released in Britain they wanted a film crew to follow us to Japan I think I'd only been on a plane once when we foster parents. Next thing you know, we're travelling the world. This was a total assault on the senses. Every single thing was fun. For me, it was an instant family. You know, coming from foster homes to foster homes. It was like the sisters I, I never had. Me and Carrie did really become really close friends. She was like my big sister. Double trouble these callers. You were murder. <laughs> After this morning, their first single right now hit the high streets and hit the charts. What number are you? Ten. <laughs> are you happy? Yes. Are <laughs> you crying? <laughs> For two of the kittens, it was time to live the pop star life. Liz was the one who could spread early and be the good girl. I mean, Tash was like, yeah, let's go out party, woo! You know, cars in trouble. Oh my God, talk about binge drinking, it's a disgrace. <laughs> we could literally drink all night and still be up at seven o'clock. And with Kerry's newfound fame and penchant for nights on the tiles, the press had found their new tabloid darling and couldn't get enough of her. I have had four sets of foster parents, three refugees, eight different skills. You know, I have had a tough childhood. I actually thought, if I get famous, that would make everything better. Unfortunately for me, because I have got such a colourful past, I didn't realise the fame was going to be as intrusive as what it was. And out of the three of us, it was me they focused on. That's when the paparazzi started. It was a lot to take on. And, like, at certain points, the two girls were getting a bit pissed off that I was being used for SMTV for chums. And I was like, look, girls, you do it. I just want to go on the stage and perform. You know, Tay, I'm right with a bit ponce, but you seem like my kind of guy. I hope you're not stuck up there. Stuck up. <laughs> it's because I was dead gobby. I had a good set of boobs on me. One of the two, I don't know. With Kerry and the girls just breaking through, for 911, the real madness of life at the top of the pops was in full effect. The boys were jet setting around the globe, performing, promoting, and partying hard. They might have been living the high life, but it was starting to take its toll on the band's dynamic. The first three years we worked so hard. I think we had ten days off in total in three years. I've actually got a schedule, it's ridiculous. Cardiff, London, Southampton, Sheffield, Slovenia, Austria, Germany, Belgium. 
me and Spike had an earpiece each. We had a guy talking in English to our ear, and she was talking German to us, so we were like, Whoa! Our workload just increased massively. It was 24-7. Switzerland, Germany, London, London, Glasgow, London. This is what it was like day to day. <laughs> wow. Wow. Looking back to how it was then, you was basically in prison. It was ridiculous. You got to the point where you just get into photo shoots and thinking, how are you going to put me in a magazine? I can't, even, I can't even knock my eyes. Right, I had half an hour sleep. I'm wrecked. It was just killing us. We were, like, fainting everywhere. We just never stopped. I remember crying and just saying that. I can't... I can't cope with it all. By 2000, for 911, it looked like things were starting to unravel. And for the kittens, friendships were still strained. Tash and my relationship, it was like that sister that you didn't really see much of unless you kind of had to. I used to get annoyed with Liz because Liz never had a yes or no opinion. Tash was always very tough, very straight down the line, and I was always very sensitive. And when they shot the video for their second single, See Ya, a divide within the band was becoming painfully obvious. On that video shoot, I felt left out because Kerry and Tash were getting, like, really close. And I had to do, like, solo shots and stuff, and a lot of their shots were together. I remember looking at that video thinking I was just doing everything by myself. The relationship between Liz and Tash was now starting to deteriorate beyond repair. We had a massive gig in GAY once, and I think she just turned around to me and said, um, you didn't do that step right on stage. I was a bit like, why did you do that? Because we said we weren't going to do that. And then we got progressively more and more and more angry to a point where we were literally screaming at each other. And she just went, ah, and she just launched at me. I kind of, like, spring jumped off this sofa. Ah! You know, you just go, what the hell has just happened? It was inevitable that if you put a group of feisty kittens together, it would end in a cat fight. While Atomic Kitten was scrapping with each other, 911 were notching up conquests around the world. But for the poster boy of pop, it all changed the night they performed with a bewitching girl band. The bewitched girls were proper, innocent, nice girls. I think the managers kept them away from us, even though Lee got there in the end. The witch supported us in Summer 98 on our arena tour. But I met Lindsay again. It was the Spice Girls concert at Wembley Stadium. And Lindsay was there. That was the first time I thought, well, she is really cute, like. Why didn't I notice her on my tour? <laughs> She's very, like, calm and serene and very elegant, beautiful. And from then on, I thought, this girl's special, definitely. And we, we started seeing each other as much as we could then. It was fun. It was fun getting to know each other and stuff them days. Got engaged and then we, we had an amazing fairy tale wedding. That whole day was just the best day ever. <laughs> so from meeting in like 90, 98, yeah, I mean, 13 years together is a long, long time. and. We just mutually decided to separate a year ago, and so hard for both of us that maybe it just had to be done. I still find it tough that we're not together. Um, I mean, I guess if she rang me tomorrow and said, how do you fancy us getting back together again, I would. She's my wife, I love her, so... But reality says it's probably not going to happen. Interband relationships like Lee and Lindsay's had tabloids fighting over headlines. But when Kerry Katona started dating Brian McFadden from Westlife, things went off the scale. We were told by the record company, do not date anyone from a boy band. Westlife being the biggest boy band that the, the was, that caused a hell of a lot of problems. Tash was furious. We started getting a bit of hate mail and things, so I thought it's all just too complicated just because I fell in love. The unwanted attention from the press led to further fights between the kittens. Liz and Kerry had a big fallout at the end. 
in the confinement of a Chrysler Voyager. Rang the tour manager up, Carl said, look, can Brian come with us in the car? I didn't know that she was bringing Brian for the day, but I'd cleared it with Carl that I could bring my little brother. And we picked Tasha up and then went pick Liz up, and Liz had come walking out with her younger brother at Joe. And because Brian was already in the car, the main thing was that Joe was just not going to be able to get in the car. So that really, really, really annoyed me. Liz is the sweetest girl you'll meet in your life. She wouldn't harm a fly. Yeah, I hit her. Well, that was it. I undone my seatbelt. I've jumped over. I've gone far. I actually shit is up in the back of the car. I was in the front with the driver. I was a bit like, what's going on? I kicked her out the car. I, I said, drive off. I left her in the street. I was scream. I was so angry. That fight really ruined their relationship. I used to make her get changed in the dressing rooms downstairs, SMTV in the toilets, uh, on stage. I literally got to stamp on her foot. It didn't end on a good note for them two at all. This debacle was the last straw for Kerry. I just completely broke down. I thought, I don't want this anymore. Obviously, then dating Brian, and I was kind of putting him first as well. I was kind of neglecting the band a little bit anyway. I think she thought, oh, we're leaving the band. I can, you know, be the wife to him and also kind of the family life that she never had. With Kerry on the verge of saying see ya for good, the atomic crisis deepened as the group discovered they were about to be dropped by their record label. I said, I won't leave yet. I'll see it through to the end of Hole again and then I'm gone. And then um, I found out I was pregnant. I said, I want to leave the band. I don't, I don't want this anymore. So I was crying in a ball, going, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? Honest to God, it was such a slap in the face. I said, listen, Liz, Atomic Kitten is about three people. It's not just about Kerry, and we will get through this. She went, hey, look, it's going to be all right. We'll get someone else in. Tash and Liz got a new member, Jenny Frost, on board. Meet Atomic Kitten, version two. The reincarnation of Atomic Kitten. It went through the roof. So it was like two weeks later, so we went to number four. When Hole Again stayed at number one for an entire month, instead of being dropped, the kittens were the darlings of the industry once more. Jenny Frost will not be joining the other kittens. Pregnant with twins, she's about to produce her own double act. Coming up, the epic demise of our kings and queens of pop. I remember saying to my mum, Mum, I wish I was dead, and I meant it. Bollocks, fuck the lot of you, I'm going. We will, we will like Richie comes home to help Five with their quest to find a new member. With a life-changing gig in their sights, the kittens contemplate life with Kerry back in the lineup. I don't think we did harmonies when Kerry was in the band. <laughs> I think they used to turn Kerry's mic off. <laughs> the big reunion is reuniting six of a generation's best loved pop groups for a one night only live spectacular. But the path of true pop is never a smooth one, and Five's comeback dreams have been shattered by last week's revelation that rapper Jay is refusing to have anything to do with his former bandmates. With the clock ticking, will they find a new member in time for the gig? The reason he's not here, in my eyes, is fear. He's scared. I don't think we're looking for someone who's gonna look like Jay, act like Jay, rap like Jay, sing like Jay. I think, um... We're just looking for a fifth member, whatever shape or form they come in. I'm going to be looking at him, and I'm sure every now and again I'll be like, shit, that's not Jay. Like, who the fuck is this cat? Pretty Boy Richie has to leave his new life in Australia to help with the hunt for a fifth member. It was somewhere when we toured, I thought, oh, yeah, it's such a cool place. It was the one place in the world I was like, I could fit in here. But before he meets the boys, he has to convince his mum, who has grave concerns about the reunion. Hello? Oh, my God. Hi. 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 
It's Richie's first trip home for years. How do you feel about seeing the lads again and doing this? Oh, look, it was funny because I've just, obviously, I've been the other side of the world. In fact, it didn't, I don't think it fully dawned on me until I was here. Moving on was hard for many years afterwards. It was really, really hard. What do I do now? You know, I still live all my days as a member of this band, and I still get recognised even today. Knowing what the tabloids can be like, you know, there's every chance that, you know, there could be, oh, you know, oh, they're back, and, you know, that kind of negative publicity that sometimes there is. I have my concerns, obviously, cos, I don't know. What? I remember when you, we met you in that hotel. I was waiting, watching the taxis, and I saw you get out, and I looked at you, and I just was horrified. Horrified. Yeah, well, I went, we... I went, yeah, 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 we... gosh, Rich, you look awful. We were just so tired. Like, we were ridiculously tired. We'd done 18-hour days for months. I went to see Simon Cowell about that, didn't I? You know, oh. I, I said the boys are cracking up. That's when I, I was getting annoyed then, I thought. This is too much. <laughs> you didn't like it when I left home, did you? No. I just felt you were a bit young at the time. I wish you'd have gone in sort of 19, 20. You know, as a parent, you sort of try to hide it and you're thinking, is this what he wants? If I'm not worried, can you not worry? Well, Shake on you, it. What do you expect? I would be concerned, my darling, All but, right. <laughs> you know, can't help it. So what's the line-up going to be now? Was Jay saying he didn't want to do it anymore? Yeah, he's not going to do it. So it's just four of us well, at the moment. We've got to, we got to... Not a massive fan of the idea of getting somebody else. I'm not. Nineteen ninety-seven. Nine one one were at the top of their game, but the non-stop touring and excessive partying was starting to take its toll. The lads were struggling to cope. The pressures of fame do affect you, and uh, no matter how good the friendship is, eventually it will. Uh, the music business will will take over you. It was just a really low time. I think communication between us three was was zero. It's going to be a long night. Nine one one were in turmoil. Tensions within the group were reaching breaking point. Even though you know you have a lead singer for the band, I think I started to kind of think, I wouldn't mind a bit of this. Jimmy was becoming a better vocalist, and I think he was a bit jealous of Lee, and he wanted to be more of a front man. I, I, I probably was resenting him, uh, wanting a bit more of the action, I suppose. We did some promotion out in America in a radio station, and I remember walking out this kind of corridor, and he said something that, that basically I just lost it. He slammed me into this glass door and stuff like, and then I just remember he pinned me up and stuff. And, and it was, it was going to be a, a full-on brawl, and I think Spike jumped in and kind of obviously calmed it down. Jimmy and Lee's relationship hit rock bottom. As well as fighting each other, they were struggling to keep their own demons under control. Lee had beaten cancer twice as a child, but the emotional scars stayed with him. I was really, really poorly. I was a poor little boy, and... I lost all my hair, and kids will be kids, won't you? And you get called baldy, and yeah, I didn't realise how much actually, how deeply it sort of like affected me, like confidence-wise, and losing my hair for the second time was hit me even like harder than the first time, definitely. So I've always had issues with. Yeah, just the way I look. Yeah. On the surface, Lee was Pop's poster boy, but beneath, there were dark insecurities. I was being obsessive about the way I looked. I used to look at pictures and I used to say, you look like shit, you look so tired, you look ugly. I just couldn't cope with it. I found the fame side hard. Like, if I was in a restaurant, someone would look at me, I'd start shaking, my stomach would turn, and I just, I hated just being recognised. So that's you, because 
Like a mob so in disguise. So I couldn't socialise if the public was there because I was just getting so nervous and felt so awkward being in public that I was becoming more of a recluse near the end. Whilst the others suffered in silence, Jimmy's demise was more public. I think for me personally, I think alcohol played a, a huge role, especially in my kind of probably mood swings and, and dealing with uh, the situations that we had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we walked into this photo shoot where, you know, they, they basically wanted cheesy smiles at the, at the camera, and it was like, I'm not doing it. And, and, and I think I did about probably half an hour, and I went, listen, bollocks, fuck the lot of you, I'm going. At his worst, a despondent Jimmy was boozing at breakfast. When it comes to Edwards, he turned up to SMTV and he couldn't even stand up. He was absolutely bladdered. And we're like, going on live TV here, and Jimmy's just a mess. With all three members mentally falling apart, 911 discovered their label had surprising thoughts about the future of the band. When Virgin mentioned the greatest hits to us, straight away in my head I thought, the end of the band. I chatted to Spike about splitting up and, and he sort of agreed that it was probably the right time. We knew we'd reached our peak and we were on that kind of little decline and we thought, well, it's best getting out, you know, at the top. There was a packed crowd waiting for us to come and perform three songs and, and we just said to Jimmy, what do you think about you know, after we've been to Asia doing the tour and stuff, that we just call it a day. Spike and Lee just decided that uh, to drop this massive bombshell, and I was like completely gobsmacked and probably gut wrenched, really. You could see it really hit Jimmy. I think I'd actually gone back to my room and usual thing, uh, you know, got the Jack Daniels out. And then we had to go, right, hello, Birkenhead, you got my body shaking. Jimmy had no choice. The decision was made, and now they had to tell the world. Out the blue, another bombshell was, uh, oh, yeah, we, we're going to announce the split on Chris Moyles. They said, oh, by the way, uh, we want you to announce it. I was like, thank you very fucking much. <laughs> Obviously, all the fans were all lined up against the front of Radio 1 in tears, and, you know, I was kind of close to tears myself, but I didn't want to show them. Thank you for everything. Thank you for five years of fantastic time in my life. Lee? And, uh, I'm off. Lee? Lee? Have a normal life. And I think in the end, I just went, right, see you later, I'm off. Jimmy just drove straight off, and uh, i never seen him for two years, and it was weird for me, because, you know, from being, like, 16, me and Jimmy inseparable <laughs> every day of the week, we were just together. For me, it was, it, was an, it was an excuse, basically, to get the alcohol out, and... Uh, I didn't have to worry about it, I didn't have to answer to anybody. As 911 split, the kittens were making new friends and taking over the world. Hole Again took the newly formed group into mega stardom. The kittens released their version of Eternal Flame, which became another number one smash. But just as they hit the big time, Tash dropped an atomic bombshell. She was pregnant. This is Natasha's last performance before she has the baby. This one's for Tash and baby Josh. While Tash was changing nappies, Liz was left to struggle with growing paranoia. With the success and everything comes, you know, people who don't like you. And for someone like me, that gets hard. A hundred people could say, oh, you're fabulous and you're this. But one could say, your absolute SH1T, and I would crumble. There was one point where I went a little bit insane. I could hear one song playing over and over and over and over in my head for days on end. The doctor had given me Valium, and just, it knocked me senseless. I think I just lost the plot. Liz was just about keeping it together, and new mum Natasha returned only six weeks after giving birth to her first child, Josh. I was feeling not confident in myself, in my body. When you come back into a band where the other two girls are preened perfectly, looking amazing, and I'm coming back feeling a bit battered and bruised. She just wasn't with it. She just wasn't with it. She was happy one day, really down the next. I'm worrying about, is the baby OK? Is he crying? Does he know I'm not there? Blah, blah, blah. And, like, they're talking about, um, like, oh, did you see that girl and what she had on? Blah, blah, blah. And it just felt a bit like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be 
able to be on the same wavelength ever again. It was a lot of pressure to put on me to, to have had a baby and to be expected to just kind of cut me tie so quickly. One of the things to help me get through it was talking to the record label and saying, look, I'm missing my son too much, so can we work out something where he can come along with me? I've asked my mum, she said she'll be his nanny. I thought him being on, on the road with us would just solve all my problems, and in fact, it just made it ten times worse. I missed you so much. I was doing, always doing something, and I could see him in the corner of my eye. And he was playing with my mum, and I used to think, I should be doing that. I'm his mum. Like, he'd fall over and hurt himself, and he'd run to my mum. And I was like, I want him to run to me. What? I just wanted someone to say, like, what's wrong? And no one ever did. Not for a long time. Nine months of being back at work before someone said to me, you've got postnatal depression. Up until that point, I thought I was going mental. And I just pulled the girls into the room and said, I'm leaving. And that is it, you know, I'm not well. And, um, they just hated me. To be honest, I got annoyed with her at first. And I was like, oh, sick, or, you know, and actually was a bit like, oh, right, OK. It's, it's an excuse. My decision to leave the band ended their career. And I know they were bitter. I remember saying to my mum, mum, I wish I was dead, and I meant it. Four years at the top. Millions of records sold around the world and thousands of fans. With mixed emotions, Atomic Kitten took to the stage for the final time. The thought of going on stage and performing made me feel physically sick. I literally could not wait to walk off the stage and it would be to be my last gig. I just shot off and left everyone there. And that was it. Coming up, the big reunion is fast approaching, which throws out a mixed bag of challenges for our comeback kings and queens. Keep doing your gym work, otherwise, you know, you could cause damage that will keep you out of the show. And after 12 years away from the band, she's back. Ta da! Atomic Kitten split in 2004 and bowed out at the top of their game. For all the girls, life has changed dramatically. Liz has maintained a celebrity profile with lots of TV work. Please welcome Liz McLaren. And the old Christmas panto. I think that it would be very easy for us to fall back into old relationships. I wouldn't say I'm scared about that. I'd say I'm petrified about it. What do you reckon, from your point of view, about the whole kit thing? I'm, I'm a bit like... I have... Well, obviously, you're older now. Mm. But I do have my reservations. I remember how it was. I remember how... You, know, you were only a very young girl, and, you know, it was quite difficult to watch. Mm. As a mother, you're being tired and ill and working 18 hour days and... It will be different, though, to how it was before. Well, I hope so. Cheers to being home, anyway. Cheers. 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 Tash became mum to Josh, now ten, Harry eight, and Alfie five. She's also quite the entrepreneur, with a chain of 20 coffee shops. How do you feel about Kenny coming back in today? I don't think we did harmonies when Kerry was in the band. <laughs> what did you used to do? <laughs> well, I think they used to turn Kerry's mic off. <laughs> She's going to love you for saying that. She'll end up killing you. We've got crunchy bran, cornflakes or porridge. Right, you want me to go away? Get the sister together. Kerry hung up her pop star pants but went on to become a reality star and has lived her tumultuous life with her four kids through a fishbowl. Go, 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 go! 
person I took over from what I was actually good at and what I actually enjoyed doing. I feel like I've done a full circle. I started my career off in the industry as being a pop star and I've been through hell and back since then. I've kind of got all the way back and gone, ta-da! I don't think people look at me as a pop star. I just think they actually forget that I was in Atomic Kitten. Since splitting 12 years ago, 911 have tried to build normal lives away from the spotlight. Lee married bewitched beauty Lindsay, but sadly, Pop's power couple didn't last. After years of struggling with his image in front of the camera, he now finds solace behind the lens as a portrait photographer. Wow. If looks could kill. <laughs> But stepping back into the spotlight brings certain issues to the surface. The two lads are quite well built and stuff, but now I'm going to get some muscles, hopefully. I just think I'll, I'll be the best shape, bodily shape I've ever been, so that's why I'm going to work, work my ass off to do it. I'm just ready, ready for everything, like. This is heavy, you know. It's not really, like, I'm just showing off. Get ready for your sprint. Have the deep breath. Get ready. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you've got it. Careful on the way back. Well done. Come on, go, 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 go. Drive, drive, drive. Well done, well done. Sprint back. Go on. <laughs> they got, look at them. They're not bad. They're coming on. Not bad. Doing good. After a dubious reign as a dancer and hellraiser, 911's Jimmy left his boy band ways behind and is now a house husband, living with his wife and two children in Cambridgeshire. <laughs> oh, not it. All right. What's the uh, what's the general feeling with the other guys in terms of the reunion? Yeah, I think everybody's uh, everybody's kind of excited about it. It's just whether the the body can take it this time. Everybody's been in the gym and working hard and trying to be as fit as you possibly can at 41 years old. Might have to change it. Change the style. I'll be a more stand up and sing rather than the uh, old body shaping. Do a Westlife and just sit on stools. Shut. Spike disappeared back to Warrington and describes himself as a budding entrepreneur. He'd left his back-flipping, break-dancing, body-shaking moves behind him until now. I'm worried about my ankle because in Tenerife, got very drunk with Sammy and her dad, and he jumped in a jacuzzi, <laughs> and I kind of followed him, but there was a wall, so I did a somersault over the wall, landed it funny, and just went rolling. Woke up next day, and I was in absolute agony. <laughs> I was stuck on walk. So that's kind of how I did it, by like being drunk with a dad acting like pissed-up ninjas. I haven't danced for a long time. As soon as going to break dancing, I'm just feeling it so bad and it's worrying because a lot of our stuff is break dancing. I don't know if I'm going to change a lot. Well, we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm still open. If they do any dancing at all, it's just top of the foot and you're just getting paid. Keep doing your running, keep doing your gym work, otherwise, you know, you could cause damage that will keep you out of the show. Next time on The Big Reunion, the dark aftermath for abs. When you're done, you're done, man. Weed hanging out of my mouth and cocaine all over. It was like there was a demon. There was something dark around you. I pick up a knife and play with the idea of doing something with it. This isn't right. This isn't right. I saw blood. The four members of five get back together for the first time in 11 years. For me, if we're going to do this, we've got to work through bullshit. Why did you chuck me downstairs? Because I lost the plot. Isn't oh, anyone speak? Let me finish what you're saying. He's turned a bit fucked up and he could switch on you. You're bullshitting. There's serious unhappiness here to the point that people are cracking up. Two more groups from the big reunion lineup go under the microscope. Being in a pop group consumes your life. I didn't know how to reach out. I didn't know how to tell someone that things weren't OK. That really upset me because we're so close and we're twins. This really cannot get any worse. I can't, I can't take this anymore. I can't physically take it. And rehearsals start to take their toll. 
it's great what you've done, and I don't want this to be you thinking that we think that it's shit. We prefer to go back to the old routine. Hey, 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 let the fun begin. It's a lot to take in. Yeah. Suddenly being here doing this. I think you're a bit overwhelmed by it all, aren't you? Mm. This just feels really not normal. Like, I just want to be home now.